Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session on lifestyle evangelism. Uh, shall we just begin with a word of prayer? So just request any one of us to please lead us in prayer. Go ahead, anyone, uh, just lead us in prayer, please. Sitkeno, you want to lead us in prayer? Pastor, yes, Pastor, my pleasure. Go ahead. Father God, we come to the throne of grace in the name of Jesus. We thank for this time you have given us. We thank for all the system you have given us. We thank you for the pastor, for the students. Lord, whatever you are going to learn, Lord, let us let that be abide in our spirit, in our heart. And we should be practiced in our daily life, Lord. We will be learning our evangelism, Lord. You should make us the vessel we should use in the king's table, Lord. We thank you for the master, for all the blessing you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay. Uh, before we go ahead, let's just do a quick review of what we did uh, last week. Uh, so last week, we started off in, with chapter five. We talked about asking leading questions, how important it is to ask the right question. So evangelism is not only about, you know, just giving the gospel or it's not only about talking, but also asking appropriate questions. Right? And we also looked at how Jesus himself, when he ministered the gospel, uh, ministered to people, he asked a lot of questions. Uh, and the reason we ask questions is uh, to get an understanding of, you know, what is their perspective uh, the other person's perspective about God or about uh, about life, about purpose, about meaning. Uh, and so asking appropriate questions. Now, uh, it's not only about asking questions, but it's asking appropriate questions, right? Because there are sometimes, you know, I've heard people said, uh, so do you want to go to hell? Uh, now, that's not a right question if you, uh, you know, during evangelism. We need to ask the right questions at the right time and uh, ask God for wisdom uh, when we ask questions, right? Uh, we also learned about very important aspect in evangelism, which is to get to know the person, right? Now, it may not be applicable everywhere. Now, for example, if we are in the uh, street and we're doing street ministry, we may not get to know the person, right? Uh, we just probably have like two or three minutes with that person. Uh, but uh, if, if there's somebody in your workplace or your college, your friends, um, and you're ministering to them, you're trying to bring in the gospel, uh, be sure to get to know them, right? Get to know what are their uh, you know, talents or their gifts and what do they like to do in their free time. So we looked at uh, how to build conversations, build rapport, build genuine friendships. Now, uh, yes, we want to lead our friends and the unknown people to the Lord, but... It's also important to build genuine friendship, right? It should not be that, okay, I'm friend. I'm a friend with this guy because at the end, the end result should be that I, you know, I should share the gospel. It should not be that, okay, uh, only to share the gospel, you know, I'm making friends with this person. No, you and I should have genuine care, genuine love. Uh, remember chapter four, we talked about how Jesus, right? He ministered out of, compassion and love, right? He had no other agenda. Uh, Jesus didn't have an agenda of, okay, uh, I'll minister to them and so that later on they will become great uh, uh, you know, people in the ministry. No, his agenda was to just genuinely care and love for them. And then we also briefly touched upon getting to know their belief system, right? Uh, there are some people who are spiritual, there are some people who are not. There are some people who you know, who think God is does not exist. Some people think God exists. And uh, have they been to church? Have they been to, uh, you know, any prayer meetings? Now, uh, eight out of 10 times, uh, you know, if there's a person who is from a different faith, eight out of 10 times, uh, you know, uh, they would have heard about church. They would have had, heard about worship or they would have been in some kind of a, you know, a situation where they've, uh, you know, heard about the gospel or they've been in a place where, you know, there's been some kind of meeting or prayer. Uh, but there are those two out of the 10 who have not been. So get to know about them, right? So maybe sometimes, you know, there's this one time 
a, a, a friend of mine, I told him, why don't you come to church? He said, no, no, I don't want to come to church because I had a bitter experience the last time. Uh, so then I realized, hey, it was it's good for me to ask them whether they have been to church before because the, the last time he went, uh, you know, there was... Uh, uh, actually, it was a deliverance service and there was manifestations and, uh, you know, people started to manifest and all of those things happened. And so he was feeling very uncomfortable. So he he felt that that's what happens in church every time. Uh, so then I had to explain to him, you know, it doesn't happen every time. This is what happens. This is the order it's of service and this is what we do. So it's good to get to know that. Right. And also, uh, inviting them for special events like worship evenings uh, easter sunday christmas these are the the special occasions where you know we can invite people so let's pick up from the next point um, i'm on page 16 on our notes uh, if you're tracking along so the first approach was asking good questions the second approach is called the prayer approach now this is one of the most important approach uh, that we should have as believers. Now, uh, Jesus himself, when he ministered to people, right? Uh, in many places in the Gospels, he he took his disciples and went up to the mountains to be alone with God. There are times he went alone. Sometimes he went with his disciples and he would spend many hours praying uh, to God. And so the first thing as believers that you and I should have is a good prayer life, right? Prayer is very important uh, in, when it comes to evangelism. Why? Because, you know, when we pray, uh, I'm sure you, you, you will have a subject, prayer on intercession, and prayer and intercession, you'll learn more about that. But when we pray, we are already, uh, in the spiritual, we are already sending forth the the word of god the power of god uh into those people's lives so for example i'm praying for uh somebody who's unsaved and pray god make his heart ready right uh, uh, we bind every work of the enemy uh, uh that is stopping him from believing open his eyes that he may uh, see the truth open his ears that he may understand uh, the word of god and what we are uh, going to share with them now when you engage in prayer remember that you are engaging directly into that person's life it is a powerful approach you know many times i have failed in evangelism because i thought okay i can do it on my own i've done it for so many years i can do it on my own but here's the thing, the foundation needs to be prayer. Right? We need to spend time in prayer and say, God, enable me. Uh, bless the people around. Uh, as I go minister to them, let your Holy Spirit uh, you know, open their hearts, bring convictions, uh, conviction into their hearts. Uh, you know, the most we can do is present the gospel, uh, but the conviction comes from the Holy Spirit. Right? So, we, we see a few verses. Let's read a few verses. Uh, Acts chapter 4 uh, and verse 29. This is not on your notes, but uh, just, let's just read two verses. Acts 4 and 29. Can one of us please read that? Acts chapter 4, verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant your grant to your servants that with all, all boldness they may speak your word. Thank you, uh, Devya. So, so here the disciples are, uh, you know, ready for their ministry. They're moving forward, and now there's threats coming from, uh, you know, people around. And what do they do? They, they they pray and they say, God, look at them. They are the, uh, they are threatening us. Yet give us the strength, give us the boldness to preach the gospel. Right. So there was always prayer. Let's read Philippians. Philippians chapter four, six and seven. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, 
but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your request to god 7 and the peace of god which transcends all our all understanding will guard your heart and your minds in G- in christ jesus amen thank you sukeno so we see here paul is writing to the philippian church right and he's telling them do not be anxious about anything but in everything through prayer and supplication right now it's interesting that paul is writing to the philippian church the philippian church was a church that was always under persecution right uh, being a church in asia minor uh, 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 they were always under persecution right but he he writes to them he says do not be anxious about what's happening do not be anxious about the church do not be anxious about people do not be anxious about persecution but in everything through prayer and supplication now there will be times you know uh, even in evangelism we may get anxious you know it's been one month i've been sharing with this person Uh, or it's been two months. I'm sharing with this person. I'm giving him the word. Invited him to church, asking the right questions. I don't see any result. He's taking everything, but there is no response. Right? Maybe we need to sit and pray. God, open his heart. Right? Let the Holy Spirit uh, convict his heart. So, very, very important. Each one of us. Right? Uh, we need to remember this. If our life as believers, uh, if we want to involve in evangelism, if we want to be powerful in our ministry, prayer is the key. Right? Uh, there's this uh, saying by Leonard Ravenhill. He he writes in this book, and he says, "Satan is not afraid of preachers. Satan is not afraid of uh, you know uh, people singing and." uh he's not afraid of these meetings and all that that happens satan is afraid when people know their god and pray to that god prayer needs to be an important uh you know aspect of our lives okay uh what's her has a question um how to reach out to a satanic worshiper okay uh now there are few things uh what's her that we must understand firstly uh it involves it is a spiritual battle right uh, remember in the book of daniel daniel was praying but he says that the 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 uh, you know his prayer did not reach the heavens because of uh, the uh, the spiritual ties on uh, in the in the clouds his prayer did not reach the heavens now firstly we need to ensure that we are strong enough in the spirit to be able to Uh, minister to a satanic worshiper now of course we know that our identity in christ god has given us the authority uh, to trample over snakes and scorpions we got plenty of verses and all of that uh, and and that first point is we should know whether we are strong enough right whether we are ready to do some now for example if somebody is in the lord for 2 years one or 2 years and uh, they directly want to go and start ministering to satanic worshipers now uh i personally would tell them to hold on wait build yourself get stronger in the lord and then as you do that seek the lord because is that your calling is that what god has called you for now we need to understand that yes the great commission is for everyone right all of us are in the great commission yet in ephesians chapter 4 paul writes to the church in ephesus and he says uh uh the body of christ has a fivefold uh vision right and we know that right apostles prophets uh pastors uh teachers evangelists uh, and so you got the fivefold ministry so we are to check ourselves okay is this what god is calling us to do right uh now if 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 in another situation if say for example you know you are at your workplace or in your college and you see you know this person does not believe in god and is more inclined towards satanic worship i would say spend time in prayer spend a couple of days in prayer do maybe 10 days 12 days of fasting and prayer now it's important because remember you're engaging directly uh, against the uh, demonic spirit so uh, don't be in a hurry 
but don't be afraid also right uh, be prepared now being not being afraid does not mean that you go we go and do whatever we want to uh, but be prepared prepare yourself and then go ahead and minister so the the ways of ministering would be the same that is you know uh, you remember we spoke about how in chapter one the gospel is the power of god unto salvation we don't need anything more than that right uh, whether he's a satanic worshiper or whether whoever that person is uh, maybe a murderer or whoever maybe the worst person in the world the gospel of christ is enough to save him so so what's uh, my answer to you would be the approach is the same you know uh, sharing the gospel the message of the cross what jesus did on the cross or your testimony uh, and uh, meeting praying for their need those things are the same approach but uh, on when to go and minister i would say take some time prayerfully uh and then go ahead and uh, step into that i'm reminded of uh, in the book of acts you know remember the sons of skiva they said uh hey paul did this in the name of jesus you know he drove out demons and all of it uh, so when we'll do it so the sons of skiva went and tried to do it uh, but what happened? The uh, uh, demons overpowered him and beat him, beat them up, and they ran out. Uh, so the point I'm trying to say is, we need to build a good relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit, and then uh, step out uh, into this. What I hope that uh, you know, answers your question. Yes, Pastor, that was very helpful. Thank you so much. All right. God bless. Okay, uh, Sitkenu says, first, my great grandmother, she is 87 now. She believes in God. Praise would be, and tell me, read Bible for her. She's not baptized. She says, my husband died Hindu. I will also die the same way, but she believes in God. When she go to heaven, she will also, she also does a lot of charity. Okay, um, now the Bible clearly says, uh, Sitkenu, that. Uh, uh, those who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? So there's two things. One is the uh, the the knowing within. Now it seems like your uh, great grandmother. Uh, you know, I'm just going to be frank, right? Uh, if she says that, uh, you know, uh, she says she wants to die a, a Hindu. Uh, she believes in God. Okay, she believes in God. Is that right? Uh, is that what I'm saying? Pastor, she believes in God and she reads Bible with me. But the thing is, she don't want. But when she she says, "When I will die, bury me like uh, bury me as if I am not a Christian. I am a Hindu because my great grandfather he died in Hindu." Okay, okay. So, uh, okay. So that that is something that you know uh, we cannot say that she is not a believer because she she knows Jesus. She knows uh, all of this. She's just trying to. You know, make sure that the cultures see it doesn't matter that after death, whether we are burnt, whether we're buried, it doesn't matter. But, you know, maybe your great grandmother is looking towards the culture to keep the culture going. Uh, now, if she knows Jesus, if she has a personal relationship with Jesus, she will go to heaven because Paul says that to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So the other things come second. This is uh, a truth that we must stand by, okay? All right, uh, so let's move on. Uh, so in the prayer approach, here are certain things that we must do, right? Uh, we need to pray first, right? Uh, because you know why, why I say this? Because a lot of uh, nowadays in ministry, a uh, lot of people want to join ministry. That's good. But they're not willing to spend time in prayer. Right, prayer is essential. Now, a prayerless ministry is not going to be an effective ministry. It's not going to be effective. Uh, we need people and preachers and leaders who pray, spend time in prayer. Right? Uh, when we, when I read about all that is happening in the body of Christ, you know, there are so many pastors, so many evangelists who've gone astray from the word. Some have even denied the faith. Why is that? 
It's because of the treasures of the world. They have, they have focused more on ministry. They put ministry up and then prayer is down here. That's not how it should be. It should be prayer and out of prayer will birth the ministry. Right? So out of prayer should birth our evangelism. And so when we pray for people, we can pray for their difficulties. Maybe some of them have financial needs. Some of them have health needs. Family is going through problems. Right? Then you can pray for job, or marriages, people that are looking for uh, over this whole season of COVID. I was able to minister to a lot of people. Right? Even though church is closed, it's able to minister to a lot of young people. Uh, and, and all of them didn't have a job. They were fearful. Right. Uh, there were some of them who called me and they were they were not believers. Right? They called me. They said, I've taken a loan now. I don't have a job. I want to end my life because I, I don't know what I'm going to do. How am I going to pay this? I don't want my parents to go through all this trouble. And so, you know, we need the wisdom to give them the right understand, give them practical steps and also pray for them. Right. And, and so this is a good time. You know, if you know people around you looking out for jobs, looking out for, uh, f uh, you know, uh, financial help. Now, we, know, we may not be able to help them financially, but we can pray for them, right? Uh, health. Oh, uh, I remember going to uh, hospitals d during the initial time of COVID, in the early 2020. Uh, God opened so many doors for us as, uh, you know, we went into a few hospitals. We began to pray for people who were admitted and... Um, we pray for them. Uh, we felt that God can minister to them, and God really ministered to them. Some of them are still part, you know, uh, started attending our online church services, online Bible studies. So uh, we, you know, the enemy is given an excuse saying the church is closed. The church is not closed. Right? God is still building his church. It's just that how we look at it, right? So use these opportunities, right? Uh, and bring in the prayer approach. When possible, very important, ask the person, hey, I heard you were looking out for a job. Have you got a job? No. Uh, okay, can I pray for you? Now, nine out of 10 times, they will say yes, because they are in need. Right? They're not going to say, which God are you going to pray to? What is his name? They're not going to ask all that. Right? I remember meeting a young family in Mangalore a couple of years back. Uh, they had a small baby and the baby was, uh, you know, uh, uh, admitted in the hospital because of a lot of complications and all of that. And, uh, and so th they were, they were Hindus. And so uh, I asked them, how is the baby? I didn't go ahead and say, you know what, Jesus can heal immediately. I didn't do all of that. I just began to ask them what happened uh, during the whole process, you know, uh, was the delivery normal? Was, uh, uh, you know, was there something that was, uh, you know, during the birth, did you notice anything? Just normal talk, right? How many people in your family? Uh, how are you ma managing financially? So I got to know their whole story. Where are they from and what they do? And then I said, uh, you know what, in all of this, uh, you know, God can heal. God is our healer. When even the doctors say, no, God can heal. And they said, can I pray for you? They said, please pray. And then I prayed, right? They didn't ask uh, which God and all of it. Right? They just said, I want my, you know, little girl to, you know, be alive and to have a normal life. Please pray. Right? So they didn't ask me which God. I prayed. And then they said, can you come again? We prayed. We did this over a period of five months. And eventually that little girl was brought to healing and during those five months I slowly brought in the word I told them what Jesus can do I told them what Jesus has done in people's lives shared testimony shared messages of uh, uh, you know uh, of people who you know transformed their lives shared the word of God and I would explain to them so over six months finally when they came out of the hospital they knew that it was only Jesus who healed them and it was only Jesus. So, so there will be times when you right then and there in the hospital, you know, I was waiting in that, in that waiting room and I, I asked him, can I pray for you? He was not ashamed at all. He said, yes, pray. And now I was feeling, okay, should we do this here? But he said, no, no, pray. The need was there. So I said, okay. And in front of that reception area, I just put my hand on him and I prayed uh, for him. So, so all of this, 
uh, coming out of your comfort zone, overcoming inhibitions, right? Uh, sometimes we feel it's not cool to do it. You know, everything is cool in God's presence. Don't worry about what people think, right? Uh, when possible, offer a short personal prayer, end it in the name of Jesus. Now, when you do that, they will see you. Firstly, they, they are authorizing God to begin a work in their life. Right? It's like they are authorizing Jesus to you know, uh, come and do a work. They may not know who Jesus is or they may not understand things, but they, there's a door that is opened in their heart. Right? And you pray in Jesus' name and end it there. Then you, when you do that, another important thing is they will see your relationship you have with God. Your personal relationship with God will manifest every time you evangelize. I don't know if you've noticed it, but I have noticed it. The day when we spend a lot of time in prayer or, or worship and spending more time in God's presence, whenever I go out to evangelize, I know the power of God will do a work in people's lives. But there are times when you know you get we get busy with family, ministry. We haven't spent that much time in prayer. We just know uh, that something's not right. Uh, uh, you know, something's not right in us. Uh, and so very important, go back uh, and, and build on that personal relationship with God. And when they see that, they, that this person has a personal relationship with their God, they will want to know more about it. Now, Christianity is the only religion that has a personal relationship with God. No other religion. We'll learn more on that and world religions in your third year. Uh, 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 and no other religion is there a personal relationship with God. No other religion. And so here you can call God your father. And they, they, when they see that personal relationship, many a times they will want it. Right? People who are going through loneliness, depression, they will want it. They want that personal relationship, right? So uh, your personal relationship with the Holy Spirit will directly impact your evangelism. A lot of people have asked me, uh, how is it that you know you, you just go to a Muslim uh, or a Hindu, you just go and talk to them about Jesus? Aren't you afraid they will, uh, they will catch you, they will beat you up, or they'll, you know, uh, aren't you afraid of it? Uh, I said, yeah, sometimes when I think of it, I, I am afraid. What if, they, what if this happens? Uh, but immediately I tell myself, I have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is with me. Right? He empowers me. Right? Uh, now, doesn't mean that this, Jesus empowers me so there will not be persecution. That will be there. But through that persecution, through those challenges, the Holy Spirit empowering is with us. And, uh, remember 2015 was the first time I went to Varanasi and uh, uh, I don't uh, I don't recommend any of us doing that but uh, was it 2015 I forget I think it's 14 14 oh, somewhere around that time we went uh, we had a first short-term Bible college and uh, we went there uh, we went to the river Ganges right and if those who are from uh, other parts of the uh, of India, uh, that place is known for its, uh, you know, the river Ganges. Uh, it's known for its place of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Hindus have their, uh, they pray there, and it's like a religious uh, place where they come and pray. And uh, uh, even, you know, those who have uh, died, they would wrap their bodies. Sometimes they would burn it and throw it into the uh, river. And so it's a sacred river. Uh, and and then it was somewhere during that time when uh, you know I always carry tracks in my pocket, and that whole place was infested with people. It was hundreds of people there. Uh, and I thought to myself, I need to be wise, right? I, I should not do the wrong thing at the wrong time. But uh, somewhere in my heart, I felt I kept looking at this one person. I felt I need to go talk to him. Um, and I went, and I uh, he was like a hardcore. Hindu guy and I just go went and I told him uh, how how do you like this festival and uh, I was speaking to him in broken Hindi whatever little I knew uh, 
then I asked him, what is this about? I wanted to know. I'm from South India. I don't know anything about this. So he started to explain the whole thing to me. I started listening to him. And then I told him, so after this, when you go back home, you're, you know that you know your sins are forgiven. You know that you're a good person. He said, no. And then I said, why are you doing this then if you don't know something? And so it went on that way. Uh, uh, and then I took his phone number and then we kept on you know, sending messages and over a period of time. And through the phone, uh, I remember praying so fervently for this man. He was probably about in his early 40s, young man. He had two small children as well, uh, but uh, very religious. You could make out, but only over the phone. I remember spending hours in prayer for this man. I would, I would say, God, you have to touch him. Uh, you have opened this to you have to touch hours of prayer. I told people, I told my prayer team, there's this man, gave their name, gave his name. We prayed for hours. Uh, after nine months of you know just ministering to him over the phone, messages, uh, he he said, uh, I'm convinced that you know this is the truth. Uh, nine months. Right? So there are times when you know, uh, when the Holy Spirit gives us the wisdom, gives us the courage, but there are times uh, we need to, you know, use wisdom, right? Uh, that's why I said I don't recommend any of you doing that because that place was not a, a good place to start off with. But, uh, but there will be times God will ask us to step out of our comfort zone. Right. Uh, so be open. Even when you pray for word of knowledge for prophecies, the Holy Spirit may give you one of the things, uh, you know, we as a church and I always tell our leaders in the church is when you are ministering to people, first pray for two hours, you pray for two hours, then you you write down what God has spoken to you. Uh, and then when you go and minister to them. Ask God to speak to you through a word of knowledge, through, uh, you know, uh, uh, a prophecy. And when we do that, uh, these are extremely, extremely powerful ways to impact the other person's life. Imagine you just know something about the other person. Right? Uh, uh, there was this one time uh, we were in a train and we were in, uh, I think it was... 40 days of fasting and was traveling to another place. And uh, uh, this guy came in with, I don't know if you've seen that, you know, come in with the bird and then the bird picks up the tarot reading or something. I forget what it is. Uh, and uh, he said, show me her hand. I'll tell you about your life. I said, okay, let me show me my hand. And I gave him my hand. He started saying, you are this, you are this. You're not, uh, you know, you're not, uh, you're not a, uh, I know that by looking at your hand, you're not a Hindu and this is what you do. And he started saying all this. So, yeah, that's good. Uh, I said, can I read your story? So I asked him, can I pray for you? He said, no, I don't want you to pray. I said, uh, see, I let you speak. Now you need to let me speak. And so uh, he said, okay, he sat and he, uh, he got to know I'm a Christian. So I said, I'm a Christian. I'll, I'll pray. Uh, now, this was when I was in fasting, okay? So don't uh, try this and say this happened. So we need to be wise. So this was in the train. So I told him, uh, uh, let me pray for you. And I began to pray for him. And I got to know that this boy was in the prayer. I just felt and I knew that this boy was, uh, like uh, this when he was a little boy, he went to a Catholic or a Christian institution and he studied. So he knows about Jesus. Right? I knew that he had two brothers. I knew that his mother committed suicide. So I told him all this. I said, your mother committed suicide. You have two brothers. Both your brothers are doing well. You are roaming around here because you don't have a job. You don't want to work. And you feel that by doing this, uh, you know, you can earn a living. And, and he was shocked. So how did you know this? I said, that's, that's what God does. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And I said, why don't you? Uh, and I began to talk about Jesus. Uh, took down his number, ministered to him. Uh, now, all this is not in English, okay? So it is all in like broken Hindi or broken Kannada and all of these things. So, uh, but here's what I'm trying to say. Uh, the Holy Spirit will, you know, give us words of knowledge, will give us prophetic words. Now, why, 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 when, how do we get that? The more we spend time in God's presence.
I love what Jesus wrote. He said, my sheep hear my voice. Right? And I always tell this to the students, you know, if the door is all closed, you're in your room, right? And your father calls you from the other room. Uh, will you will you not open the door? You know, it's hey, that's my dad is calling. I need to go. Wow, because you recognize his voice. Uh, but if a stranger calls, you say, hey, who's that? Uh, I need to go and check, right? You may not recognize that voice. My sheep hear my voice. So as believers, uh, we need to hear the voice of God. Now, when I say the voice of God, it's not the physical voice of God, but uh, we can hear it in our hearts. We can hear it in our spirit. The Holy Spirit is our guide. He speaks to us in different ways, right? So take this approach of praying. Uh, firstly, personal prayer, right? Uh, that, is, that needs to be there. And then when you meet somebody, be open to pray for them as well. Right. Then you've got another approach, which is the two-minute approach. We looked at this before. Your salvation experience, you tell them, hey, before Christ, I was like this. Uh, and then, you know, I prayed. Uh, this is what had happened in my life. I experienced the love of God, and I was able to move ahead in life, and God changed me. Uh, you know, I didn't have purpose. I didn't have direction. I was lonely. I was fearful. But this is what Jesus did for me. So uh, I believe that he can do it for you as well. Uh, so if, if you're okay with it, uh, can I pray for you? All right. Um, and then there is the power encounter approach, a very powerful approach. The power encounter approach is is there are four points here. Let's look at each, right, on page 17, the power encounter approach. So first one, healing. Now, if somebody in your, uh, you know, your friend or your, uh, a person that you want to minister to is sick, what you can do is you can directly pray for that need. Say, you know what? Hey, you've been suffering with this migraine headache for the past five years. Let me pray in Jesus' name that you know this headache will go, will never come back again. This is what Jesus did on the cross. This is what the Bible says. Right? So, if you can allow me to pray, so that's the power encounter approach. Now, Jesus did that, right? Uh, remember, he uh, he brought healing on that blind man. He said, uh, "Do you want to be healed?" He said, "Nobody is there to take me." To the no, don't worry about that. In Jesus, you're healed. And he places his hand, uh, he, and he's healed. Right? And there are plenty of power and counter approaches that Jesus took. Right? Uh, Lazarus, Jesus is in front of Lazarus' tomb. Uh, and what does he say? Lazarus, come forth. Right? I, I can picture the, uh, the Gentiles, the Romans, all of them standing there and, and looking at this. A power encounter approach. Right? Then there's a word of knowledge approach, right? That's what Jesus did uh, at the as this uh, to the Samaritan woman in John chapter four, where uh, you know through the word of knowledge God was able to reach this woman's heart, the Samaritan woman's heart, and uh, eventually she uh, gave her life to the gospel as well. And also uh, an interesting chapter is First Samuel chapter nine. Uh, 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 I encourage you to read those, you know, First Samuel 8, 9, 10. It's wonderful how Samuel chooses uh, Saul as, uh, as a king of uh, Israel, but uh, Samuel is more worried about his donkeys that have got lost. Right? And, uh, uh, and, you know, uh, sorry, Saul is more worried about his donkeys that got lost. And in First Samuel 9, what a powerful, powerful way that Samuel just begins to, uh, you know, express the gift of word of knowledge. He says, Samuel, Saul, when you go ahead, you will meet three people. After you meet those three people, you go ahead further on, you will meet two other people. And uh, those two people will give you bread. And then you walk on uh, further on, you'll see a whole uh, army of people uh, praising the Lord. And then you will join with them. The moment you join with them, the Holy Spirit will fall on you and you will be anointed from God to be the King of Israel. And so a, a complete, you know, a, a whole story of what, uh, uh, you know, what Saul was going to do, Samuel knew it before then. 
right? And he and and he just gave it to Saul. And we see later on it's the exact same thing that happened. And eventually, uh, uh, you know, Saul found his donkeys. So uh, next one is prophecy in Second Kings chapter five. Uh, uh, Naman. Uh, is in leprosy and he's got and no one's got leprosy and uh, what happens the you know the his people say why don't you go to the prophet and uh, he will pray for you uh, and then after that uh, elisha prophesies and he says if he comes i will uh, and and when he comes i will send him forth and he will be healed and then later on he comes and uh, he gets his healing. Uh, so healing, word of knowledge, and prophecy are three powerful ways of approaching people in evangelism. Right? Uh, pray for their immediate need. That's maybe healing. Uh, and two, word of knowledge. Right? And three, prophet prophecies. And then there's the miraculous interventions like uh, you know, pray for jobs, pray for visas or college admissions, financial needs being met and all of that. So uh, so these are the four approaches that uh, we have. Now, important is while we are ministering to people, don't worry about, okay, which approach do I take? Should I take this approach or this approach? You can always combine these approaches, right? Uh, you can share your testimony and do a prayer approach. You can combine all of it. It's not like I have to follow that. Uh, but the important thing is to know, to practice, to 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 be bold, to to know how to speak, uh, to speak in wisdom. Very important, right? Now, any questions before we go ahead? Just uh, any questions, um, any thoughts, any questions, and then I just want to a little more uh, points that I want to share. Any thoughts? Any questions? Should we go ahead? All right, let's go ahead. Uh, so next point is uh, more about taking the appropriate steps, right? Uh, after you have shared the gospel, there are steps that we have to take, right? Uh, now, you can invite them to church, right? Invite Firstly, invite them to pray right then and there that you've already done. Uh, maybe you can tell them, hey, why don't you go pray at home? right? That's another option. Then you can encourage them to ask questions or search for answers, guide them to a website. Uh, now we have apps and so much of material online, which they can go and check. Uh, invite the person to discuss later as well. Uh, so now remember that it is complicated. I mean, in the sense that, you know, the whole thing of understanding the gospel may not be easy always, right? So they may need some time. So give them their time. Uh, if you have a gospel of the book of John, the reason I say the book of John is because John writes uh, most eloquently about the, the, the Trinity and it's, it's the most uh, precise book uh, that, you know, especially uh, unbelievers, people from other faiths can read. Uh, so give them a copy of the uh, book of John, invite them to a small group, maybe a live group or meetings. And now here's the thing. If they continue to show disinterest, let them go, right? Don't push things on people. Now, the wrong thing to do is to push people to, you know, no, you have to do this. You have to give your life to Christ. If you know, uh, it's happened many uh, times when I've heard where, you know, people say you have to, if you do this, if you give your life to Christ, that's when your school admission will become less. Or if you, your children's school admission fees will be lesser. Or if you give your life to Christ now, then, you know, uh, right now, then all your house loan will go or all your um, sicknesses will leave you and go. Now, these are the wrong ways approaching God, approaching evangelism right because i've heard of plenty of testimonies where people have said that you know if you believe in jesus you'll be healed so now only believe in jesus and then after they prayed they did not receive the healing right or uh, you know they were on a loan say you pray to jesus you believe jesus will uh, clear your loan and then uh, you know now accept jesus they in a hurry they 
you know, made the salvation prayer. And then a couple of years later, the loan is the same or even gone worse. And so what happens? Not only comes a bad name to you and I, but it becomes a bad name to Christianity and to, to the person that we represent, who is Jesus, right? So uh, be careful, give time to people who need time. It may take a year, it may take two years, it may take one month, it may take five minutes. Uh, different people are different, right? So give them their time. Now, even as you engage, just a, a few points uh, on page 18, rules of engagement, like we saw, show genuine care and love. Don't treat people like projects, right? Uh, now, project one is what? Okay, getting this boy, this Muslim boy into the faith. Project two, getting this boy. No, people are not projects, right? I'm always reminded of this. Such a wonderful, wonderful saying. Paul writes to the, uh, uh, to uh, I'm not sure. I think it's Timothy. To Timothy in, in his last letters, he says, he says, Timothy, you are our crown in the Lord, right? Now Paul had so many things to boast about, but he could have said, you know, started my first, second, third missionary journey, Lord, and then I did this, I did this, I did this. These are the number of churches I planted. Uh, 12 years of ministry. Uh, I did more than all the 12 disciples did together. Uh, and there was so much he could have boasted about, but you know, he doesn't say that. He says, you people are my crown in heaven. So it's not about the number of people we have reached out to, or it's not about how many maybe 100 people have come to know the Lord. It's not about the numbers, but it's more about the genuine love and care that you show to people. Right? The numbers will will not matter in heaven. Right? Uh, uh, it's how genuine, how well, how lovingly you have ministered to the people. Right? So don't treat people as projects. Two, don't be judgmental or criticize other worldviews and religions. Now, Christians are guilty of this. Right? Um, I remember, uh, you know, I moved from Bangalore to Mangalore and I began to talk to a few pastors around and I asked them what happened in, in the year 2008 uh, eight to 10 was a very difficult year for Christians in Mangalore because the churches were being persecuted and, you know, the uh, fanatics would come and beat the uh, church, destroy the things in the church. Now, when I came to Mangalore, I saw that there was nothing wrong in Mangalore. I mean, there are people, fanatics are going to be everywhere, but we did outreaches openly. We did Christmas carols openly. I have never in the past four years seen any kind of problem. So I began to ask a few pastors what happened. And I got to know that, you know, some of them, some of the pastors around in the city of Mangalore, they began to preach saying that, you know, don't worship idols. Those idols are devils. And, you know, you will go to hell with the idols and this and that. And, now that went, you know, it spread around. And so the news went to these people and they say they came and they just, do, you know, started doing all these problems. Now, whose fault is that? That is our fault because the pulpit time is not time to say stories and, you know, what other people are doing. The time on the pulpit is to preach the word of God, right? And so that was our, our problem. And, you know, it was our, the body of Christ, the Christians who caused that to happen. Right? So never judge other people, never criticize their ideologies or oh, how is it, you know, how can it be? It doesn't make sense. It may not make sense, but never criticize, right? Do not condemn people because when you condemn them, you will immediately lose them, right? Uh, don't be judgmental saying, oh, I have accepted Christ, so I am the holiest of holy people and only I can enter the... Uh, holy of holies and all of those things, right? Nobody, people from other faith don't care about the holy of holies and all of that, right? Uh, so just don't be judgmental. Our goal is to share Christ and let them encounter Christ. Uh, they will come to understand later on, you know, what pleases God, what does not please God, right? Uh, 
avoid arguments right when you're going through debates and you're talking with people if if you're if they're genuinely asking questions give them the right answers with love and care but if it's going into an argument cut it right there end it just stop the discussion go further on you don't have to win all the uh, you know uh, discussions last point let me close don't let negative responses pull you down there will be times when if people don't respond well or they respond negatively don't let that pull your spirit down but in the natural it's very easy to get you know discouraged oh uh, you know i've been sharing with this person but you know nothing's happened yet uh, don't be discouraged in the spirit stay strong stay in love stay in the joy of the lord go on to the move on to the next person and you know share the gospel so uh, we will close here anybody have any questions any thoughts you want to share uh, if not we can close in prayer any thoughts any questions am i going too fast is it okay are you able to understand everything okay uh, yes nicholson yes pastor everything is going well yes nicholson has raised his hand uh, yes hi. nicholson hi hi pastor so yes. i i just i mean it's kind of related to what you're talking about but not completely so i want to know now with regard to you were talking about how people if they don't really respond and you you've given your best and you said okay just move on which i understand like it it the seed is planted it might bear fruit in its season and i get that but um, in terms of sometimes this is a special case of course but i've seen about one or two and these are believers who attend church okay and they know the word of god and they and i feel like they don't know the salvation message and i'm very stuck on what approach to take to even like really tell them where this what is the truth because we are attending church we know the word of god we understand everything we are worshiping but how do you really make them understand i i hope i'm clear that a little vague but i hope you understand yes yes i understand <laughs> yeah. yes thank you nicholson for that uh, question so a uh, very good question uh, i think i was in that spot many years back where you know we just go to church we don't really know what the gospel is uh it happened even to the jews right uh, the jews uh knew the scriptures they knew everything but they just following it there was no relationship so uh the most the best thing that we can do in these kind of situations especially it is it happens when you know your parents or your whole generation have been christians and you know okay sunday you got to go to church you come back you go to sunday school you know it it just becomes a normal thing uh so it's it's a dangerous thing because we lose that relationship so uh the best thing to do is to again and again and again present the gospel the clear gospel now they may know it right but the more you know we present the gospel we're saying hey you know what this is what jesus did they'll say i know uh, but is, do you believe what if he jesus can do this is this is what the word says remember hebrews chapter 4 talks about uh, the word of god is sharper than a double edged sword right so at times the word is just given once it just touches people's lives but it, it at times you need to dig in you need to you know continually give give feed the word of god right and paul writes to the uh, writes to timothy and, and he says to the ephesus to the church in ephesus he says preach the word in season and out of season so a lot of emphasis on the word so in this kind of a case when there are already you know christians and uh, you know they know everything the best thing is to continue to you know drill them with the word of god and eventually the word of god will bear fruit in their heart so uh, and then it's good to you know ask other questions are you bearing fruit in your life uh, what is it that god has called you to do all of those things but when you give the word more and more there will be a change uh, uh, in their hearts so yes uh, i hope that answers uh, some of your, uh, your questions yeah thank yeah. you thank you so much thanks yeah. thanks so All right let's let's close in prayer i know sorry i've overshot them let's close in prayer uh, could one of us please close in prayer uh, what sir would you mind closing in prayer please okay pastor yeah.
Father God, we thank you so much for this time. Uh, we want to thank you for Pastor's life. Thank you for the clear teaching which he, he has taught us. Help us to put that in our life. And Holy Spirit, continue to guide us, lead us, Lord. Bless each one of us, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we'll catch up next week. Have a blessed week ahead. God bless. Thank you, Pastor.